Historian versus open source databases. The benefits of historians debunked. Okay, this now sounds really like clickbait, but if you have read my articles, the stuff I'm telling about. So what we will do is first, we will take a look at the common misconceptions about historians. And then in a separate video, we will talk about what the actual advantages in the modern age of historians are. Let's take a look at the biggest point, reliability. This, is, this always comes up, but what does it mean? In one of my favorite books, Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Kleppmann, he says, reliability is the ability of a system to continue operating correctly, even though faults and errors occur. So if historians were superior in that respect, then they should have a lot of documentation on this, right? How to handle failovers, what, what algorithms they chose, what assumptions and trade-offs they do, because there is no, if you take a look into scientific literature, there is no right or wrong in all of these things. Can only do assumptions. But when looking it up, you actually don't find much of it. In contrast, if you take a look at open source databases, there is a lot of information there. There's, they describe in absolute detail how they ensure that no data is lost what algorithms they choose for consensus to uh, ensure that um, data is not double written in there. And they even say sometimes when they don't choose the latest fancy stuff, because you don't always have to choose the latest fancy stuff, but you have to take a very close look at it and consider what's the best solution. Additionally, they even have way more stuff that I know historians don't have. They, they integrate well into Docker and Kubernetes, they integrate well into metrics and logging. So if anything goes wrong, you can easily come, come back from failures. You are easily notified if something starts to slightly deviate you. That can directly create a help desk ticket. In contrast to that, historians are often just this, this big black box that you put, put on a VM with a, yeah, trust me, bro, this will run for, for 10 years. And it also makes sense. If you take a look, like the open source databases, these are the databases that power big architectures of the internet and that they process way more data than a typical factory does. So it makes sense that those databases are actually, because they are applied across different industries, that those databases are actually more reliable than a small, I don't want to sound arrogant, but in compared to the overall bandwidth of the internet, what happens in a factory and the data that stores that is actually small. So compared to those smaller use cases, um, it actually makes sense to choose the bigger ones, the open source database. Second big misconception is compression. And it always comes up, yeah, open source databases say they can't compress data. I think the biggest point there is that there is a misconception between lossless and lossy compression. So in the IT world, compression usually means lossless. So all the data that you take in is just simply stored. Historians, however, they also classify lossy as compression. So they apply something like exception reporting or swing door algorithm you now from the Pi system to reduce the amount of data that they need to store. And that is also perfectly fine, but it's not lossless, it is lossy. What they do is swing door algorithm, they decide before writing to the database or exception reporting if, for example, the, the, the value is within the sensor inaccuracy range, when the sensor value is just fluctuating a little bit. If it's still in the range, you don't need to store the values, only if it deviates significantly out of there. It's fine to not store it, but it's not directly comparable. So and very often in these benchmarks, you always compare those non-comparable algorithms with each other. But if you then now try to compare the actual algorithms with each other, they're roughly the same. And additionally, I would even make the point that compression isn't even that important in today's age. I mean, Look how cheap storage has become. And it get, got even cheaper with technologies like AWS Glacier Archive. I just looked it up today. For one US dollar per month, you get one petabyte of data, which is very, very good for long-term archival. So even if you were to store it three or four times, different regions, whatever, it would cost almost nothing. So I would say the best solution there is to have all the data that you need immediately and very often, the last days, months, whatever, or for, for troubleshooting, error reporting, etc., to have it on the disk in the factory, and then to report for this archival purposes, just report it somewhere to AWS S3 bucket or any other. There are a lot of other vendors out there uh, for long-term archival. And, and basically, you don't even need compression anymore. If you just now 
put some standard compression on it. It gets really cheap. Uh, if you now want to compare and do the same and throw data away, you can also do it. Then you almost pay nothing anymore compared to an historian. These were the two biggest misconceptions about it. And you can also sort a lot of others in there like performance, no data, open source database cannot store so much data. This is, uh, I think we already talked about this. These are the systems that power, power the world's internet. Uh, they can definitely store the amount of data, but you cannot can't just simply use a Microsoft SQL database. Yeah, this I agree, you can't uh, store a lot of data in there. But there are actual benefits of historians and we will explore them in a separate video. So thank you for watching. And if you're interested in more content of this, feel free to check out the description. You will find videos, blog articles, guides, all about industrial IoT and the Unified Namespace.